Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way. And as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and apostles and the apostles and elders whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened and chose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barthabas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. The title of my message is By God's Grace Alone. Key verses, verse 11. So in the last passage, Paul urged the Gentiles to turn from worldly things to the living God. He also taught us the right attitude of a Christian by saying, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. So we should not avoid the hardships, hardships not only the circumstances, but in our personal life. We should not avoid it by watching YouTube mindlessly, stay all night. But we have to face it and take up the cross mission with the resurrection faith. So today's passage describes the first church council held in Jerusalem. It convinced to consider whether Gentile believers need to be circumcised 
in order to be saved. The Jerusalem Council decision was that we are saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus alone. They did not require new Gentile believers to be circumcised as a condition of salvation. This decision paved the way for a subsequent fruitful world mission work. So may God bless us to become gracious servants of God. We should not make difficult for the new believers to come to God and invite new believers to salvation by God's grace alone. Uh, first, first teaching from the circumcision group. After Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey, Antioch church was filled with world mission vision. They must have put maps of Galatia on the walls of their houses and marked the cities Paul and Barnabas had visited with red dots. Perhaps they prayed every day for the new converts, calling those whom they knew by name. And many have decided to go out as missionaries. However, before the gospel continued its advance, church had to resolve one issue. Look at verse one. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and said, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This was a serious issue. Their preaching was like pouring cold water on the rising fire of world mission. Some strict Jewish Christians found it unthinkable that the Gentiles could be saved without circumcision because it was the sign of covenant with God. So they insisted on circumcision as the condition of salvation. But later we'll see that the circumcision is, is not just a physical procedure. It means to acknowledge the entire Jewish law as a binding and necessary for salvation. The Gentile Christians at Antioch had to simply accept Jesus as their savior by faith. Then the Holy Spirit worked in their hearts to forgive their sins and give them the living hope in the kingdom of God. But this man claimed that it was not enough. In addition, they need to be circumcised and obey the law of Moses. And this was a direct attack on the gospel of the grace of God. The true gospel teaches that Christ finished the work necessary for salvation on the cross. Jesus said, remember, it is finished. All a sinner needs to do is to receive him by faith. The moment human merit or work are introduced, then it is no longer a grace. Grace means a gift. It's a free, it's a free. Under grace, all depends on God, not on man. If conditions are attached, it is no longer a gift, but an obligation. Salvation is a gift. It is not earned or merited. So now, here we have to note that the question of salvation for Gentiles was not an issue. That was obvious. Even the Old Testament talks about Gentiles being saved. And they had seen Gentiles being saved. The question was, how are they going to be saved? That's the issue. Is it by grace alone? Or is it by grace and law? That's the issue. How do you get saved? And that's the still issue of the church today. Some people say, yes, you are saved by faith, but you must keep the Ten Commandments to hold your salvation. Some say, yes, you are saved by faith, but you must keep the law of Moses in order to, be, you know, to become true disciples of Jesus. Some say, yes, you are saved by faith, but you must keep certain traditions of our church, like the sacraments, baptism, and so on, so many rules. So how did Paul and Barnabas deal with this controversy? Uh, first, they did not allow them to mislead their Gentile converts. And second, they stood up and challenged 
There are four doctrines of salvation. So can you imagine uh, the shock this Gentile believers felt when they heard a message from the circumcision group that what you have been told is not enough. They began to question their own salvation. And they were very much troubled. Paul and Barabbas worked very hard to assure them of their salvation in Jesus Christ. And this brought Paul and Barabbas into sharp dispute with the circumcision group. But there was no immediate solution. And there was a danger that this issue might divide churches like Jerusalem versus Antioch, Jewish Christian versus Gentile Christian. The Antioch church decided to consult with the apostles and elders in Jerusalem to reach some agreement over it. They, they respected the apostles' spiritual authority, and they wanted to maintain unity with them. So the Antioch church appointed Paul and Barnabas along with some other believers. And Paul and Barnabas took this opportunity to hold the World Mission Report meetings on the way both in Phoenicia and Samaria. Paul would meet many who have been scattered to this part of the world from Jerusalem as a result of his earlier persecution before his conversion. The title of his mission report might have been a former persecutor turned to missionary by the grace of God. Paul, a life for the Gentiles, the conversion story of Gentile believers. And he was delighted to tell them of the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles. Look at verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Paul and Barnabas must have told about the fruitful ministry in Antioch, where scores of disciples were ready to go out as missionaries to Gentile territory. They must, be, they must have reported about their first mission journey telling how Sergius Paulus had been converted by a great sign from God, and now how the whole island of Cyprus was now a right mission field. They must have told about the birth of new believers in Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. But the critics were ready. Look at verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So how did the Jerusalem church resolve this issue? Uh, second, saved by God's grace alone. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. Luke does not give the, any details of the debate, but he takes up the matter toward the end of the debate. Peter's position is reported because of his great significance. Look at verse 7b. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Peter's address was based on his own experience when he witnessed the conversion of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Through that event, God taught Peter to accept the Gentiles. At the time, Peter did not circumcise Cornelius to be saved. Shortly thereafter, at a meeting of leaders, Jerusalem church also accepted the Gentiles. Still, however, some of the circumcision party thought that the Gentiles must be circumcised in order to be saved. So what did Peter say? Look at verses 8 and 9. God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. So Peter makes a point that God has made no distinction between Jews and Gentiles in giving the Holy Spirit. Both were able to receive the cleansing of the heart through faith. Paul said in Romans chapter 2, 29, circumcision is the circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. So here you can see that circumcision it's not just the visible and physical symbol, but inward transformation of the heart. It is a matter of a purification of the heart. 
So why is that important? So there is a saying, we may know what is in the 10 foot deep water, but we may not know what is in the one inch deep heart of a man. So what that means is that no one knows what's going on in others' heart. Someone may look gorgeous and handsome outwardly. Everything looks fine outwardly. But his heart may be filled with filthy and ugly thought. Written law reveals our many dirty sins, but cannot change our hearts. No one can change our hearts. That's the reason why God cleansed our dirty hearts when he believed in his son's blood. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from our sins. And God gave us the Holy Spirit as his approval and acceptance. So look at verse 11. Our key verse. So Peter makes a very emphatic statement that people are saved by God's grace alone. This is as much as a personal testimony as a theological statement. Peter himself was saved by God's grace alone. Remember, Peter was an ordinary fisherman. He could have spent his whole life chasing fish across the Lake Galilee. At last, he, could, he would have died and destined for eternal condemnation. But one day, Jesus called him, follow me. Peter followed Jesus and became one of his top disciples. But he could not give up his human dream to become the prime minister in Jesus' earthly messianic kingdom. And he made many mistakes with his big mouth. Crucially, he denied Jesus three times it was a total and complete failure. Yet Jesus did not condemn Peter. Jesus loved him to the end, unconditionally. It was the grace of Jesus that he was restored as his disciple. So later he wrote, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. So you might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Peter was saved by God's grace alone. Likewise, Jews were saved by God's grace alone. Gentiles were saved by God's grace alone. So note, Peter said, it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. He did not say Gentiles will be saved the same as the Jews. He said, we are saved just as they are. Grace triumphs over all ethnic distinctions, all ethnic boundaries. Peter's speech silenced all the critics. When the apostle Paul heard Peter's clear statement, he must have said, amen, Peter. Thank God for your clear uh, position. When Paul tried to earn his own salvation by keeping the law as a Pharisee, he felt wretched because he could not keep it. He cried out in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death. But he found peace when he met Jesus and received the, his forgiveness of his sins. So that's why he said, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Without grace, it was unthinkable for Paul to become the apostle for the Gentiles. It was the pure grace of God that saved him. Martin Luther was a Catholic monk. He was not sure of his salvation, and he tried to earn his salvation through sacraments, fasting, and penance. He even performed the acts of self-punishment, like an enduring cold winter night without a blanket, and also he whipping himself. And also he even climbed the stairs with the broken glasses with on his knees. But he was troubled more in his heart. But he was born again when he believed in Jesus alone through Romans chapter 1, verse 17b, the righteous will live by faith. Salvation is God's sovereign work through faith. And we accept it by faith alone. So that's why Ephesians chapter 2, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. If he contributed even 1% to our salvation, 
we would boast about it as, as if we did 80% of work. But we did not do even 1%. God in his wisdom saves us by his grace alone. The glory for salvation work belongs to God alone. So when you realize this truth, we can be happy because we are, our salvation does not depend on our effort, only depends on God alone. And so we can have the assurance of salvation. So we must depend on God alone, God's grace alone for our salvation. Salvation does not come from our good character or our good job or our family background. It is given by God's grace alone. We should not add anything to the grace of God. So then, what is the purpose of the law for a believer? After being saved, can you live as you please? Notice that salvation or being saved is expressed in three different ways in the Bible. Purified, become children of God, and enter the kingdom of God. These are all synonymous to being saved. So after we become children of God, we have to learn how to live as a children of God through the law. If we keep the law, we experience heaven on earth. If we break God's commands, we experience hell on earth. So for example, if you disobey God's command and commit adultery, you will experience hell on earth, all the family troubles. And through the law, we realize how, how sinful we are and appreciate the cross of Jesus more and more. And also if you break God's commands repeatedly, we give others the impression, the bad impression that we are not truly saved and our fellowship with others will be greatly damaged. It's not a condition of salvation, but the expression of our salvation. A third, the Count's decision was based on the word of God. No doubt Peter's testimony carried great weight in the Jerusalem Council. He gave the clear principle that the salvation comes by God's grace alone, not by human merit of any kind. So on this basis, Barnabas and Paul began to share what God had done among the Gentiles through them. They told of miraculous signs and wonders God did. When they finished, James spoke up. This James was the brother of Jesus and moderator of the Jerusalem Council. Since Peter's miraculous escape from prison, James emerged as a leader of the Jerusalem church. So it was up to him to share the judgment of the council. So he quotes the prophecy of Amos to show that what is happening is in agreement with a prophecy. Look at verses 16 through 18. After this, I will return and reveal David's fallen tent. His ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. And the remnant of man may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things that have been known for ages. So according to prophet Amos, God had a salvation plan for the Gentiles. God knew that all the Gentiles would bear his name someday. So this will happen when Jesus comes again. Even the most devout Jews like James could recognize God's work among the Gentiles and base decision on the word of God. So look at verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. So in essence, James was saying that since God had accepted the Gentiles simply by faith, the church should not make it harder for them. Instead, they should accept the Gentiles into Christian fellowship. Although James made this decision, it seems to have been the consensus of the entire council. So in this way, the issue of circumcision that evoked passion in the hearts of many was settled in a meaningful way. At the same time, all believers, both Jew and Gentile, could be united in the church. James went on to give a few instructions for the Gentiles. Look at verse 20. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. So all the Gentiles 
knew that this particular acts were repulsive to the Jews, they should not provoke the Jews by doing these repulsive things. And the council decision paved the way for future successful world mission work. So it was the historical moment for the world mission history. So in conclusion, so in this passage, we learn that we are saved by God's grace alone. It is not by anything we have done, but what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So when we believe Jesus as our Lord and Savior, God forgives our sins, purifies our hearts, and gives us the Holy Spirit. So it is totally God's grace. This grace makes us thankful to God. This grace enables us to work out for world mission purpose. This grace enables us to embrace others with love and respect. So may God bless us to throw away our human tradition and to hold on to the grace of Jesus and live for his world mission purpose, glorifying God.